Hello everyone, my name is Adam Gray and I'm the coach for 46168G Teamwork. I also volunteer at my wife's school at Brentwood Elementary 11860 and by trade I'm a software engineer working for Salesforce. I would like to welcome you all today and thank you for listening. I'm going to be talking about building a robot and I know that we have a wide variety of coaches listening here today but this all starts with you. So whether you're just starting out and you barely know what you've gotten yourself into, or if you could be up here um, engineering a robot and giving a better talk than even I could, I hope I have a little bit of something for everyone. And uh, I just want to mention that you know I may show some things that work for my teams. They may not necessarily always work for your teams. Your skill level and your kid's skill level is going to vary wildly. So please take away anything that you can from what I'm going to discuss. If you have any suggestions or tips, uh, I would love to hear them as well. So without further ado, let's get started. So every year presents different challenges, new and unique changes, and, that, and that's not just the game. Uh, we have a new game to solve every year, but we also have new kids to teach. We have new programs, new rules, potentially new faculty in our schools. But the first thing that you have to take into account is what your skill level as a coach is. And if you're just getting started and you have no idea what to do or where to go from here, uh, I'm going to start by covering a little bit of what's available and maybe give you some ideas of where to get started. I would also like to challenge the coaches that have been doing this for a while, don't stop learning. Model for your students how they can continue to grow over time. Come up with something new, have something new built in the classroom. And for all of those in between, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Get in there, build a robot, uh, do what the kids do, and see if you can solve some of the problems and challenges that they solve. So. We all have a wide variety of experience. We all have a wide variety of background knowledge and what we bring to the table in problem solving and engineering and programming and everything in between, um, people management. So that leads to a wide variety of skill sets available in our program. And that's not just our coaches and our assistant coaches and our volunteers, but our kids as well. So we want to be able to create a program where everybody can bring those skill sets together and have some success, not just in scoring the most points or winning trophies, but in learning how to work together as a team with cohesion and building a robot that solves a particular problem and being proud of what you've done. Now we are fortunate that VEX has created a curriculum around educating coaches and not just a curriculum for STEM in general and robotics and programming, but also in educator certification as well. It takes about 16 hours and if you are just starting out, it is a great place to start to get your feet wet and dive in. I highly recommend you pull a kid off the shelf and actually try this stuff yourself. Get in there and build and see what it takes to get this stuff done because your kids are going to start coming to you with questions and you have to know either the answers or you have to be able to ask them questions to lead them to possible answers or at the very least know where they can go to find the answers. So please don't be afraid to dive in, get your hands dirty. We're going to be doing some of that today. Now if you haven't already been beat over the head with this <laughs> in day one, the notebook is the most important thing that you can be doing for your kids in this program. Programming is important. Building is important. The teamwork is important. But it is all bound up in one single place in the engineering notebook. And it's been said that if you're not using the engineering notebook in, as part of your process, you're not really doing engineering. You're just randomly putting things together and seeing what works. And that's just trial and error. Engineering is a discipline where you start with the problem, you prototype some solutions, test those different prototypes, figure out which one's the best, and implement that one. Then find new problems to solve and repeat the cycle over and over again. That is what engineering is, and that's what we're trying to get at here, and this is what we're trying to teach our kids. So given that we have to come up with something, we need to start at the very beginning. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And every year it's pretty much the same. It's the game. And in order to solve the problem of the game, we need to understand the rules of the game. Well, we've already had a session on that, and if you didn't see it, I highly recommend you go back and give that a look and a listen. Uh, but right now today we're working on building a robot, so we're more interested in what the constraints for the build are. 
And for those, we can still find those in the game manual. So here in the game manual, if you scroll down into the table of contents, you'll see section two outlines the rules for the robot itself. Now we're not gonna read through everything in section two, but I highly recommend that you go back through and look through everything so that you fully understand what the expectations are for your robot and for your team and how it operates the robot at a competition. But we are going to point out some very specific things in the robot rules that we're gonna to need to know at the very beginning. So we'll just kind of highlight them real quickly as we walk through. Uh, R1 is one robot per team. That also means one team per robot. So no sharing of robots at competitions. So R2, robots must represent the skill level of the team. And this one is one of the most important rules in the game manual, in my opinion. So R3, robots must pass inspection. Pretty straightforward. We're not gonna go cover all of these in depth at all. Um, only registered teams may compete in the VEX IQ Challenge. This rule is mostly ends up being about license plates. <clears throat> so in the past, you'd register and you'd get a couple of license plates. They look kind of like that. Um, you would write your team number on it. You can see it here in the manual. And um, in the past, you'd have to put it on the robot so that it was visible on two sides of the robot. Uh, this year, it only has to be on one side to be visible. Uh, it can be, there are temporary license plates you could put on that have to follow the rules of decorations that are also found in the game manual. And new this year, if you have 3D printing available at your school, there is a template for this, uh, the 3D object file on VEX's website, so you can print your own in various colors and 3D print your uh, team name. And that would be a fantastic way to help customize your robot and give students even more pride in what they're building. Uh, R5, this is really, really what we're here for. Starting configuration. Now I'm gonna read this one verbatim because it is very important to what we're doing because this defines the constraints of our build. At the start of each match, the robot must be able to satisfy the following constraints. Only be contacting the floor and or the field perimeter. Now this is important because in years past, uh, there have been times when the robot is not allowed to touch the perimeter at the start of the match. This year, that is legal, and it allows for the dimensions of the robot to be defined as follows in Part B. The robot must fit within an 11 inch by 19 inch area bounded by the starting positions, and the starting positions are defined earlier in the document. And C, be no taller than 15 inches from the floor. Now. This is specifically for starting configuration. It does not specify how big your robot can be ever. Now, in years past, there have been expansion limits. So what we do here is we can search for expansion. And we find here, in earlier in the game manual, in G4, pre-match setup, it lists exactly the same criteria as in R5, but robots may expand beyond their starting size constraints after the start of the match. That means there are no size constraints after the match starts. You can go as wide as you want, you can go as tall as you want, you can go as long as you want, you can do all three. It doesn't matter. As long as your robot fits within that original 11 by 19 by 15 cube or rectangular prism starting position. So let's go back to the robot rules and just peruse the remainder just so we can be thorough. So R6, the starting configuration will be inspected. This makes sense because if your robot can expand in any which direction after the start of the match, then the only one that they can really constrain and check is the starting configuration. Uh, VexIQ product line, you, you have to use VexIQ the only exception to this are the metal shafts, which VRC also uses. You, you can use either one, because they're basically the same, and rubber bands. You can use the standard um, two, two different rubber bands. Um, they're in here, number 32 and number 64. So, and that is all defined in the non-VEX IQ components. Um, there is decorations that you can add as long as they are non-structural functional parts of the robot. So you can put in little stickers for your sponsors or for your school or whatever, just as long as they're not holding pieces together or providing a slick surface for things to move on. As long as they're non-functional, 
totally fine. Uh, R9 is you can only have one brain. R10 is you can have up to six motors. Uh, R11 is only one battery. R12, keep your firmware updated. R13, you may not modify parts except the metal shafts, which can be cut to custom lengths. Please be safe when you do this. Um, make sure that everybody has proper protective gear if students are nearby when they're done. Uh, I probably would do this yourself, and I know you know we're supposed to be hands off and everything, but. Uh, an angle grinder or a Dremel is probably not something a third grader should be using on a metal shaft. Um, R14 is, this isn't BattleBots. Um, R15 is, your robot must pass inspection. So, please go through and actually read them all, all of the individual parts, especially the blue sections, just to make sure that you are aware of what all of the intent of the rules are. Uh, they are very valuable for you to get to know. So those are the constraints for the robot and the initial build and it's really 11 inches by 19 inches by 15 inches and it can expand any amount after that. So that gives us a lot of leeway that we can work with and what we're going to do. You can still only have six motors so that is a, an additional limitation so you can't have 15 arms grabbing different things because you just won't have enough motors for it unless you're really really creative. Um, but there's more to the game than just the rules, and we got to think about getting around the field, moving. Uh, right now, most robots will start out with a uh, pretty standard one-to-one -one gear ratio in the drivetrain. Uh, they move at one speed, but this year's field is bigger. Uh, you really want to consider teaching your kids how to build a gear ratio for their drivetrain to get that robot faster. Nobody has souped up motors. Nobody else's motors are modified to go faster than yours. They're just using gears. That's it. So please look into that. If you are having trouble getting from one, field, one side of the field to the other to score the points, maybe your kids need to look at making their robot faster. Um, additionally, we have one type of game element this year, which is different from last year, where we had cubes and balls. We have just the risers this year, so we need to figure out how to manipulate those risers. All we're doing now is pushing them around and stacking them, so at least the movements are fairly simple, but they're kind of big and awkward. So you can see the picture that I have there, but I do have one kind of here with me, and it's, you know, it's not square. You can still kind of grab it, you know, a couple different ways. You can pick it up and lift it or whatever and you know there's there's a lot of things you could do with it but when you stack them they have to be perfectly parallel with the floor so they can't be like sitting up on a side or whatever and if they are you're gonna have a really hard time having anything stacked on top of it so uh, these are things that we have to take into account when we're building our robot it has to be able to manipulate the game elements and finally scoring um, Scoring is not just being able to score a point or two points or 30 points. Uh, it's really about how efficient your robot is. And typically, the robots that can do multiple things at the same time are going to be better. They're going to be more efficient. If you can stack two stacks at once, that's going to make you automatically better than a team with a robot that can only stack one riser at a time. Encourage your kids to try and brainstorm ways that they can manipulate multiple risers at once, whether they're holding risers already stacked or they're lifting up multiple risers or pulling them into some sort of intake system. There's a lot of different options that they can explore, but I highly recommend you think about how do we manipulate as many risers as possible because that'll give you the ability to score as many points as you are able to and it will save you a lot of time during your match. So now that we've briefly talked about what the constraints are, what the rules are, and kind of what the game is, and a little bit about scoring, like we haven't talked about it a lot, but again, with the session earlier about game strategy that Jake did, uh, you should already have a really good idea of maybe what kind of strategy your kids might want to pursue and which direction you might want to lead them in. But beware, if you let your kids start with something so complicated, they'll never finish it in time. So the best thing that you can do for your kids is to start small, iterate quickly, find the errors in their robot as fast as possible, small little cycles, small little fixes, 
fix the low hanging fruit first and make gradual improvements to the robot over the course of the year so they can continually practice driving and making improvements every single meeting. A lot of kids, when they first start, aren't very comfortable. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to do it. Like They might have an idea in their head, but it may be this grand robot like R2-D2 here, and it just it's not going to work. And you can see that it's not going to work. So for those kids who may be anxious or unsure or lack confidence in what to build. They don't know where to start or maybe they do know where to start but the, their ideas are so grand that they'll never get them done in time. We have Rise. <clears throat> so every year Vex releases a basic robot build that you can have your team start with that will get them playing the game in a relatively quick amount of time. So there's a lot of things that you can do here. Um, you can just give them the instructions and say hey build this and we'll start here and that's a fantastic way for a lot of kids to start uh, if you have some kids that are more advanced and have a lot more confidence and are ready to kind of get started on a build and they've done this for a year or two already or maybe they're just master builders and they're just ready to go then maybe just show them a picture of this and say build something like this and let them go and see what they do or if they're really experienced and they, they just have no need for this whatsoever, they may already know how they're going to build an intake that pulls up and has a stack already and can stack three risers all at the same time in less than eight seconds. Uh, you kind of have to go with what your kids can do. So maybe there's an in-between. Maybe they should skip ahead. Maybe they just start here. And for most of what we're going to do today is we're going to start here and we're going to look at what some of the things that you can teach your kids to do in order to model some of the problems that there are with this robot because this robot even though they've given it to you and it can play the game it's it's okay at it it's not the best it's not hyper competitive it's not going to be getting all nine rise all nine stacks on the field and clearing it and scoring at 302 points and winning worlds it's just not going to happen it doesn't matter how good you are driving it it's just not capable. However, it can be a fantastic place to start to teach kids the principles that they need to build something even better. So with all that said, like we've not really got into building anything yet. All of this is set up, but in terms of the setup and for especially for first-time coaches or coaches who have only been doing this for a, a year or two and still are trying to get a grasp of everything. Uh, I thought we'd pause and take any questions that people might have uh, over what we've gone over so far. And then once we resume, we'll get into taking a look at this robot a little more in depth and seeing what some of the deficiencies are and see if we can't make them a little bit better. Okay, here we are. It's a new day. It's Perhaps it's the first meeting after your kids have finished building Rise for the first time. Perhaps it's your first practice, like real practice, after you've selected your team members and they already built Rise during a summer camp. Maybe it's January and you've got a lot of ground to make up because your school has only just now allowed you to start having a robotics program. Whatever boat you're in, we all are following the same process and it's just the engineering process. So assuming we're all starting with Rise, uh, and this is what I'm going to do today, is I'm going to take a look at Rise and point out some of the things that I think are deficiencies with the robot and some things that we can maybe improve upon a little bit and we're going to work on it little by little. <clears throat> so because we have the, uh, the magic of cinema working with us, I can actually make these changes for you so you can see the beginning and the result instead of this being a four hour session where you just watch me put pieces together. So let's get started. Okay, so I've already mentioned before how important the notebook is. This isn't a notebook. This is just some loose leaf sheets of paper on a clipboard. But that's what we have to work with right now. Uh, one of the things that you can do is if you have somebody who's in charge of the notebook, you can have each team member have their own engineering journal that they write their notes in. And then they can turn those notes into the person that's handling the notebook who will compile them all into a single bound format. Um, but uh, as is typical with an engineering notebook, um, you know, you're going to write today's date and the date of actually today is irrelevant, so we're just going to leave it blank for now. And uh, this entry today is by Adam Gray. 
what we did yesterday, our last meeting. So we're just going to write down last meeting. Last meeting, we finished rise. So at this meeting, you wanted to identify what some of the problems with the robot build are. So we can just list. Now we're going to go back and forth between this notebook and the robot and things may jump around a little bit, but I just want you to get a good idea of how we would go about like just simply writing in the notebook. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to have the perfect language ever. It doesn't have to be this super nice font face writing. It just has to be thorough. So we're going to work through this and try to make it thorough today. Okay, so here we have Rise. I built this out of the green pieces that we have at home, uh, green and black, because that's what my team here at home has. And I really like the contrast of the green and black. So one of the first things that I want to do is point out a little bit of what the current game manual, or not game manual, but the instructions for Rise have that are slightly incorrect. Uh, this section, uh, these, this crossbar, uh, it lists the beams being incorrect length. If you look at the piece that it says to get at the top, uh, it lists the wrong piece. But if you look at the piece in the picture that they're putting together, that one is correct. So whole count that and make sure you get that correct. The same thing goes with these two pieces on the back. It lists those incorrectly as well. So just whole count and make sure that you're using the correct pieces. So one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to start to take a look at uh, basically the structural integrity of the robot. So one of the first things you'll notice is that the wheels are really far back in comparison to the rest of the robot. There's a lot out front in the robot. Now one of the things that they've done in here, and you'll see here, is that they have these 1x4 beams in order to prevent tipping. It also provides a nice contact point for adding structural integrity to the robot. And remember, triangles are strong, so this is a good engineering principle being shown in, at work here. However, it would be a lot better if we could get these wheels up here. So then you wouldn't need this part. We still would probably want the, the triangle for the support, but then you wouldn't have to have these plastic beams rubbing against the wall or possibly getting caught on something, uh, especially because what can happen, and if your kids drive this around and try to score some points, uh, you could potentially get this stuck inside the goal when you try to push a riser into the goal. And if they try to turn out of it, it'll get caught. So we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So that's one thing that we could do. So let's write that down. So the wheels are too close together. Okay, so let's look at something else. And right now I'm kind of working from the bottom up because I like to have a good strong drive base to work with. So one of the other things that you might notice as you're starting to build the drive base, and it's right at the very beginning because they have you start to build the drive base first, is that this axle back here, they have as a two length axle. And you can see that the shaft collar barely fits. So what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna be driving around and this is gonna work itself loose if your shaft collars are just the least bit old and your wheel is going to fall off. So it may not happen, maybe it'll be just fine, but if you look up here, you can see there's actually a little bit of gap on this one versus this one. So that's another potential problem that we have. So we can write that down. Okay, moving on. Uh, one other thing to notice is that these axles are plastic. At no point do I recommend ever using plastic axles on a drivetrain because the entire weight of your robot is pushing down on these wheels. So let me see if I can show you what this means. So that means that this wheel moves all over the place. And if you can see here, if I just set it down, the wheels already well, the angle doesn't show it too well, but the wheels are already canting out. Like you see that as we, even as we start to try and turn, they're moving all over the place. Now, part of that is because of the plastic shafts, but the other part of it is that 
these shafts are only supported by one piece here. Now typically for extra strength, you would also want that axle supported on the outside. So another thing that we could do is we could add uh, more two by, two by plates to the outside to hold these more sturdy. So that's actually two problems, so we can write those down as well. Okay, so that basically covers some of the structural integrity and stability of the drive base, but it doesn't really address the speed. So one of the things that we talked about earlier is that the field is bigger. So you really want to introduce a gear ratio into your drivetrain. And so that's one of the other things that we could write down. And that gives us a pretty solid list of things to start with, with just the drive base. And we haven't even gotten into the actual rest of the robot, let alone the manipulator for actually scoring. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But first, I wanted to actually go through and make some of these changes one by one so that you can see kind of uh, what it might look like to make the changes, write it down in the notebook <clears throat> so that you can have kind of a guide on what your kids might be doing. So with all that said, I'm gonna get started. And I think the thing that I'm going to start with here is that the wheels are on plastic shafts. So that one's a pretty easy change out. We can do that pretty quickly and we can see what the difference it might make is. Uh, after that, uh, the wheels have no outside support. So we can, we can do that second maybe and then compare and contrast with what was before so you can see what kind of stability you can get from having outside support for your wheels as well. Uh, the rear axles being too small, uh, we can actually combine this with this one. Uh, if we're gonna be trading out the plastic shafts for metal ones, then we might as well just use the right size axles for our drive base to begin with. Uh, the wheels being too close together, uh, I'm not gonna tackle this one quite yet uh, because this one may tie into the gear ratio on the drivetrain. So we could combine those two into the third thing that we're going to try with the drive base. So here I'm going to start, I'm gonna do number one, and then I'll do number two, and I'll do number three, and we'll come back and uh, compare each one. So we'll fast forward through all of the monotonous, boring, tedious part of it, and we'll check back here in a little bit. So now it's right about here. Your kid's known as a problem. Because we're not using the plastic shafts anymore, the ones that the instructions had you use were capped. And the reason that they were using the capped plastic shafts is because you can put them through one of these two by pieces and it'll hold them. So they'll be captive. And then this plate could be positioned on top of the other plate and it will hold them in place. So you don't have to worry about extra support for the wheels. But now, as we're switching to metal shafts, you find that there are no capped metal shafts. So while we were able to add <clears throat> shaft collars on either side of the front wheel, uh, there's nowhere to add it on the rear of the back wheel. So that brings us back to uh, one of the problems that we had noted earlier, and that is that the wheels have no outside support. Now, so here, you've now identified another problem with the solution that you had to an original problem. But that problem can be solved by fixing the second problem as well. So that's what we're gonna do here. So now we're gonna combine one and two into our new number one, and that should solve this problem for us. So we keep building, and we come up with this contraption to tack on to the outside so that the wheels can be held more captive. But now we start to notice a new problem. In order to complete this, to have the shell on the outside, we're gonna to have to do both sides at the same time, which means taking the wheels off the bottom and redoing that at the same time as the top. So your kids may start thinking when they get to this point, 
Well, if we have to take everything off already anyway, maybe we want to just throw some Omnis in there. Maybe we want to just, let's widen out our wheelbase and stick another wheel in there or move a wheel closer to the front. So they may come back to their notebook and you may start to see something like this where they decide, you know what, we're just going to do all three of these things and we'll just rebuild the whole drive base. Is a trap. And this is something that all kids everywhere run into eventually. And not just kids, this is something I see in my professional career all the time. In fact, it's something that I do myself on a fair occasion, amount of occasions. So what this trap is, and some of you coaches may have already recognized it, is a concept we call scope creep. And basically, when we started this, all we were trying to do was replace a couple of these with some metal shafts and be done with it. And then we found out that we didn't quite take into account every little last detail. These are capped in a, and being held captive. But because we jumped right in and started building, we didn't have a good way to keep the robot together. So the big issue here is that now you're at the end of your practice and the robot is half put together. Your kids may have spent the entire practice today working on this section and they got no driving practice done. Uh, no programming could really get tested at this point. Maybe they were able to actually put a little bit of code in, but the robot is not drivable. <clears throat> so your team is stuck until they actually finish this build. This is a huge mistake and ends up wasting a lot of team's time. What we had talked about earlier is that what you should do in these cases is not just dive in and build straight away. You should prototype instead. So let's go through and do that and show a little bit of what that looks like. So I'm going to put this back the way it was and we'll look, like, look at prototyping instead. Okay, here we are back to our original build. <clears throat> So now, instead of just taking the robot out that is perfectly serviceable, drivable, and able to be used during practice, what we're going to do instead is actually start to design and prototype some different options that we have to work with. So it's important to come and look at the parts that you're currently using and compare them and contrast them with the parts that you're going to be using. And this can help eliminate some of the errors that we may make when we decide that we want to switch from plastic shafts to metal shafts, for instance, and going from captive capped shafts to non-capped shafts requires a little bit different type of design. So one of the things that the kids can do is they can attempt to build this type of drivetrain separate from this robot. Just one side of the wheels. So let's actually put this in the notebook. So we're going to continue on the next page. And now what we're going to try and come up with are ideas. We are brainstorming after all. So what we're trying to come up with is a better type of more stable wheelbase. So right now the goal is to use metal shafts. So we know that we're going to have, you know, a metal shaft and it's going to go through some kind of plate that has a hole in it. And that is then going to be connected eventually to some kind of wheel that will go on the shaft. And we're going to have to have some kind of shaft collar on the back and maybe a shaft collar on the front. So we can always label these in our drawings. Let's call this a uh, 2 by 16 Walking through the design of this, if you have to draw it out, it makes you start to think about what the actual design is going to be. So if we come and try and do this in a top-down model, so we've got our 2 by 16 here, and then we're going to have to have some sort of metal shaft 
going through the hole. Now that's going to be attached to the tire, or the wheel, somehow. We know we have to have the shaft collar on this side, and we know we're going to have to have a shaft collar holding it in on this side. But this isn't all there is to it, so we also happen to have a gear here. We have another gear here, and another gear here. And right now, this gear is driven by the motor. And here is where our problem area is. So we can maybe come up with some ideas to fix that. Maybe the first thing you want to try is turn the motor around. Maybe another thing you could try is put, put the motor on a different wheel or different axle. So those are two things that we could potentially try. But some of your kids may remember that at one point they built a claw bot. And the Clawbot's drive base was a little bit different. And one of the things that we had identified as a problem previously was that the metal shaft, well, the plastic shafts themselves, didn't have support on both sides. They only had it on one side. But when we built the Clawbot, so our Clawbot, it had a drive base that looked kind of like this, where there were two shafts, or two plates, we'll call them 2x16s, and then it had your gear inside, with the shaft collar inside to hold it and a metal shaft going through. And then your wheel was attached out here and your shaft collar out here to hold on the wheel. Shaft collar back here, just for safety as well, if you needed to. And that seems like that might work really, really well. So this is a, a third idea. So that seems like we've got three different ideas that we can maybe try. So we'll have a conversation with our team about which ones we want to try, you know, and more than one kid can develop one idea at a time, but maybe we want to do, let's do this one. And if, if this one doesn't work, we can try out some of the other ones, but uh, let's, let's try turning the motor around and then we can put it on a different wheel later. Um, the reason that we might want to wait and put it on a different axle later is because it works out really well for the distribution of power if the power is being distributed from the middle out to the both wheels instead of from one wheel through multiple gears all the way to the front. So here we have something that we can prototype. So let's do that. Okay, so here's the beauty of what we're about to do. This robot can go practice driving or the programmers can take it and do some practice runs on it. But while we're doing this, while we're working on building, you're not destroying the only robot that you have. So here we go. Let's build a prototype. But now you can see we have basically one side of the robot completely separate from what's there currently. Now this is something that you can take and you can run some tests on it. Now one thing we notice here, if we try and spin it, it doesn't really spin all that free. And that is because the wheels are right up against this plate. So one thing that you might want to consider is have A, have your students test the part out and see if they notice this and if they don't point it out to them, but B, the kits come with spacers and washers that you should use any time you have plastic or rubber parts rubbing up against other plastic or rubber parts. You could easily use a washer in between the gears and the back plate, and even in between the front plate and the shaft collar. And then I would put a spacer here between here and this plate, front plate, and the wheel. And that'll get it to move a little bit more freely. In fact, Here's a version where I have already done that. See how much freer that spins? Super easy. And here's one other tip, lock plates. So one of the problems with 
the wheels that we get, I'll take one off and sh show you, is that it's really thin. So your metal shaft is going through that hole and it really doesn't help support much. So what you can do instead is take these two by two lock plates with the square hole in the middle and you can just pin them inside the wheel. That increase doubles the amount of surface area that the metal shaft has to work with. So it gives you a much more stable working area. So this seems like it'll work pretty well. So now that we have them built, <clears throat> we can just go ahead and if it's a good time with our team and they're in the, they've finished practicing for a little bit and they're going to go and write in their notebook uh, what they've done and record their runs or the programmer has some debugging to do. Now the builder can come and just swap the parts out on the robot and see how it performs. So let's do that. Well, but first let's make this one a little more like this other one so that they behave the same way. You can see that's already making a huge difference. And the wheels, the wheels spin freely. And they spin freely on both sides, which is pretty great. So now the only thing we have left is we have lock plates in this one and no lock plates in this one. So let's put the lock plates in this one and they'll be equal and we can put them on the robot. Okay, there we go. Now the colors in this one don't match and this is one tip that I also wanted to point out. Right now we are planning on driving this middle gear. <clears throat> so one thing you can do if you have multiple colors of gears uh, to help the kids understand gear ratios a little bit better, you can color code the drive gear versus the driven gear. So that way it's not as important with this particular build because this is a one-to-one -one gear ratio, but uh, when we start to think about making this robot faster, it'll make it a little bit easier for them to remember which is which and uh, whether or not it is making the robot faster or stronger. So again, now that we have these built, let's put them, install them on the robot and test it out. And the other great thing that I wanted to point out about these as well before we get too far is now you can imagine building multiple different versions of this and having a bunch of different tests that you could run simultaneously while not destroying your robot too much in the process. So you can see how even this comes out pretty cleanly on its own. So now, We've swapped out one side and it didn't take all that long. We didn't destroy the robot in the process. So let's actually compare. So one of the side effects is that it made this side of the robot a little bit wider than it was. So you'll have to be careful with how wide your robot is and make sure it is still legal. But look at how much sturdier this wheel is compared to this. It's a huge difference. So now I could go through and I can update the other side or I can show you instead a couple of other options that I have made uh, for this particular robot. So you've already seen this one that had the color-coded gears, and this one was the one that I built that had the washers and the spacers in, plus the lock plates, which we incorporated into this mock-up as well. But one of the things that we haven't talked about yet <clears throat> is moving the wheels out. So this is actually a component that I used on for a different build, but it, in, it basically describes the same situation. So here we're using omnidirectional wheels and we have gears separate because they were going to be driven from above. 
Uh, it's a little different than these, but you can see how you have a lot of different options on what you can do and how you can do it. Now, one that I built that's similar to this, that instead could work on this robot in theory, is this one. Now, this one is a chain driven with a small gear ratio. <clears throat> However, this is one of those times where you can quickly put something together and test it. And you can see it works, but every so often it slips. You can hear it clicking. And that's because the sprocket here it is only contacting the chain just on really just two of the sprockets. So just one of these little crossbars on the top and on the bottom sometimes because you don't want your chain too tight. Otherwise you'll increase the friction and it won't work very well. So in this case, this might work more or less in low torque situations and it will definitely make the robot faster, but you also potentially introduce an issue here. And a way that you can solve this is similar to the structural integrity here, is you move the motor up or back so that you have more of a triangle, so there's more surface area for the chain to grab onto on this sprocket instead of this tiny little bit on the top. But you can see this one's built exactly the same, so it could just be, you know, stuck on this robot pretty quickly in about the same amount of time. Now, if you have enough parts, you can have your kids build a bunch of these. They could even compete in building these and see who makes the better ones. So now that we have a working prototype and we're going to implement it into the robot directly, we'll come back to the notebook and we can document what we've chosen. This one is the winner. You could go in even more depth and list out your options. So we really only built two different options here and they were both pretty similar. So this is, we'll call this one the basic and then we'll call this one basic plus washers. Um, and three we didn't do um, for lack of time, but Imagine we did do, you know, some other one. And then we can come up with tests. Now, if we can come up with good tests that we can do for spinning free, I mean, we held them up and we, we spun them and, you know, if we spin it and we time it, you know, maybe we can, you know, give it five spins and time how long it continues spinning and take the average. So maybe the basic was basically, it didn't really spin free at all. Um, and then the one with the washers, let's say it averaged, you know, five, five and a half seconds. You know, sometimes the kids are spinning it really fast and sometimes they're not, but uh, that seems like a big improvement. Uh, stability for the basic was pretty good. Uh, well, it's definitely better than the plastic shafts, um, but this one was even better than that. So if we give this one a B, maybe this one gets an A because the lock plates are even better. And then let's, uh, for fun, say that we did the, the gear ratio. And this one, it, it, it spun free. I mean, we, we tested it a little bit, but it's more than the first one, but not quite as much as the second one. So it's maybe like a second and a half, you know, if you hit it hard enough. And the stability of these, we still use the lock plates. So the stability was basically the same. Maybe for what we're trying to do right now, this is the one that we want to build. So now in your notebook, you've shown what you were going to build. You've built it and now you've tested it and you've given examples of how you've tested it and now you have a reason for why you chose what you chose. So now you have the whole engineering process written down in your engineering notebook that is more or less easy to follow. You know, 
we've got all these diagrams here and maybe they're a little convoluted and their direction isn't necessarily perfect, but this is what I'm trying to show is that it doesn't have to be this perfect looking instruction manual that you've done at the end of your process. It's going to be a little bit messy. It's going to be a little bit haphazard. You want it to be legible and you want people to be able to follow it. But the whole idea is that we've gone through finding problems to coming up with ideas and prototyping solutions and then testing those prototypes and then implementing them on the robot. And this is what building a robot is all about. This is the engineering process at work. So here we are. We've finished changing out the prototype. So we have a completed drive base change based on the prototypes that we had. So now we're ready to move on to something a little bit different. Odds are your kids will get this robot, they'll take it out on the field, and they'll try driving it around. And here we are with one of the elements that it's going to use. So you can see how it intends to lift these. But one of the things that you'll find is that the higher it gets, the more uneven and the more vertical it goes. You'll also find out that this arm is not particularly well suited to stacking a third riser. In fact, I don't believe it's even capable of uh, stacking a third riser and completing a, an entire stack. So once you get your drive base to a good position where your kids are uh, happy with where it is, it's fast enough, it's strong enough, it has enough stability, uh, it's time to start tackling the mechanism that we're going to use. So one of the things that I wanted to show a little bit is that Again, you don't have to tear apart your robot in order to test different mechanisms. So this is a four bar. It is not perfectly parallel because you can see this side is longer in its connection than this side. So what that means is the higher it gets, the more uneven it gets. So if it were a perfect parallelogram, this part of the arm would stay perfectly level all the way up and down. So that's one possible change that you could make. You could increase the size. There is some room to give on this robot. Uh, another thing that you could do is change out the lift mechanism entirely. You could maybe look at making an elevator type system like a lot of teams did last year. Or you could start teaching your kids fancy linkages. So one such type of linkage is where you take the four bar, but instead of the four bar going out this way, you turn it around so that it's reversed and it starts from the front and comes back. But what you do instead is you attach another four bar onto the back of it going back forward. So this is what we call a reverse double four bar. And it looks like this. So this is just a simple well, maybe not simple, but this is a, an example of a different type of linkage. So a four bar is just a type of linkage. A reverse double four bar is also another type of linkage. So imagine if this part of the four bar were attached to the robot and the motor was driving it here. So what the reverse double four bar will give you is it will give you in a short amount of space a lot of height staying completely vertical instead of swooping in a circular motion. So what will happen is your motor will turn, turn the bottom here and it will cause the rest of this mechanism to raise up. So what ends up happening here is in a really short amount of space you can get quite a high and very tall mechanism. But this is a fantastic example of yet another form of prototype. This isn't the type of prototype that you could install on the robot immediately and it would work or not work and they could test it out, but it gives them something that they can use their hands with to get familiar with what the shapes are. 
So this is one potential way that you could maybe build a lift system for the robot for this game, where stacking that third riser may get a lot easier. But most kids aren't going to just come up with a double reverse four bar on their own. They're going to need some inspiration. They're going to need to see some real things and from real life. They're going to need to look at front loaders and dump trucks and cranes, you know, various types of heavy machinery and equipment that can give them real ideas for mechanisms that they can incorporate into their robots. Now the real world is a great place to take inspiration, but it's not the only place. In fact, one of the best places to get inspiration for your kids is from other teams. And one of the best resources that we have available to us for that is YouTube. A lot of teams out there put content out on YouTube sharing their builds with the world. There are a lot of robot reveals that show some really interesting mechanisms that would give your kids ideas for things that maybe they want to try. Maybe they see a claw that looks really interesting and like, how did they build that? And then they can come up with prototypes and ways to build that. Or maybe an arm system that's different than anything they've ever seen. But if you come to YouTube and you just search Vex IQ, filter by upload date, and you'll see the most recent videos that have been uploaded. Use this resource. If YouTube is blocked at your school, see what you can do to get it unblocked, at least on one computer that you can use to show them videos. Find a way to give your kids access to this resource because short of going to a competition and meeting these teams in person, which a lot of times is not possible because they're on the other side of the world or in a state that you'll never visit for a competition, this is all they have to really communicate with these teams. Now, maybe they can't necessarily directly ask questions, but they can see what the teams have built and maybe try to infer why they built it that way. Reverse engineering is, in fact, still a type of engineering. Just, if you're going to take inspiration from other teams, call it out in your notebook. Say, hey, we saw this really cool robot on YouTube that looked like it did this sort of thing, and you know, we took a lot of inspiration from that. So we built this mechanism that is kind of like theirs in these ways, and we made some changes or improvements in these ways uh, to make it our own. But don't be afraid to go out there and see what other people are doing. It is one of the best things that your teams can do. So again, we've gone through now, in just a few simple examples, the entire engineering process. We've even started with what happens if you let it get a little bit too out of control and your kids can wind up in a situation where they're, they feel stuck and they get frustrated because they don't have a robot to drive and the competition's coming up soon and they don't know what to do. So utilize this process, research, brainstorm the ideas, prototype them, test them, then implement them into your robot. Don't just let your kids dive in and destroy the robot and Hopefully, maybe they'll have something working by the time you, you need to have the robot ready for a competition. Try and instill in them what the actual engineering process is and help show them how to document this in their notebook. Once they see how easy it can be to go from beginning to end in the engineering process, it'll start to become automatic. They won't even th hesitate or even have to stop and think about what would I put in my notebook because it just comes out because it's part of the process. That's what we want to try and instill here. So we're not just building a robot because it's fun and it's cool and you can get a really great job and make a lot of money and like while well, those things are, are sort of true in some ways, uh, what this is all really about is about problem solving and communication and learning some of these skills for life that are super important and super valuable no matter what they end up doing going forward. We're building confidence in these kids and giving them the idea in their head that they're not limited by what other people say that they can do. They can go in there and they can program a robot. They can engineer a solution that nobody else came up with. They can see things that other people can't see, but they can also be humble and accept help and ideas from other places. They're able to work with other teams cooperatively to achieve a goal. There's so many things that we learn from this whole process, and I hope that just building a robot isn't where it ends for your team. So again, this is a completely custom experience. 
It's not just a custom robot or a custom process. The process is fairly well defined. So we need to be creative problem solvers when we run into issues. We need to be methodical with how we build our different prototypes and components and methodical in how we test them out and determine which one is the best. But the most important thing that you can do for your kids is to stay ahead of them. Get any education that you need, learn what you need to learn, reach out to other coaches. I'm sure that any of the coaches that you've seen over the course of this conference would love to hear from you and would be happy to share information with you. This is all about working together. You know, we're here to be Team Indiana, Team USA, Team Earth. We're going to be able to be our best selves if we can do it together. So model all of these things for your kids. Model failure. Admit when you don't know something and say, you know, I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know what piece you should use for that. Let's look it up. Let's find out. I know somebody that I can go and ask. And celebrate their failures because their failures are finding things that they can improve upon. And that is the whole goal of engineering is to find those weak points, find those failures and fix them, change them, improve them, eliminate them, engineer around them, automate them. Finding failures is, is what we're doing. So it should be rewarding to find those failures. And please remember, put everything, literally everything in the notebook. Anything that they've written down, any conversation that they've had, any pictures that you've taken, put it all in the notebook. So we spent a lot of time talking about concepts, but this talk is about building a robot. And we've talked precious little about specific drivetrains or lift systems or mechanisms. We haven't really talked about sensors at all or how you might use them. We haven't talked about gears and gear ratios and sprockets and linkages. We didn't talk about chains and treads and all the different parts that are available. We didn't talk about shock absorbers. The space is infinite, but I hope what I've been able to explain to you today and give through an example is that building a robot is a process. It's not just following the exact directions because that's just assembly. What we're trying to teach and what we hope our kids are learning is the process of engineering, which requires creative problem solving, not just following directions. Now there is some rote learning. They have to learn the names of the parts so that they can communicate with the other teams, so that they can search for things that they need to try and learn how to build. But what I hope you take away here today are the concepts that I'm trying to explain, where I walked you through the engineering process. I taught you about prototyping and showed you some of the pitfalls that come with biting off a little more than you can chew. I hope that you are aware now of the trap that kids can get in when they go to make one change, which leads to another change, which leads to another change, which leads to the entire robot disassembled a week before the competition and they're pulling their hair out, stressed out, because all they needed to do was this one little thing and a prototype would have proved that it was either possible or not. So please don't get hung up on the little minutia and the details around building and programming a robot. Enjoy the ride. But do get out ahead of them. Make sure that you are capable of answering their questions or at least able to point them in a direction where their questions might be better answered. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or any of the other coaches that you see here today. And it's only through conversation with other people that we can sharpen our skills. So thank you again for your time. And if there are any further questions, uh, please ask.